morning, everybody. Welcome to everybody in this room. Welcome to all those joining us online. Let's give a shout out to the newest of newlyweds, two weddings in the congregation this past week. Let's put our hands together for Mr. and Mrs. Mason and Marissa Huang, if I got that right. Congratulations, Mason and Marissa. Are you here today? I think they might still be on their honeymoon, but Ted did their wedding at the gazebo down in Zionsville last Sunday afternoon. So they've been hanging out in the young adults crowd on Monday. So all you young adults, 7 o'clock Monday nights down in Zionsville, there's a whole pile of them hanging out down there. So join Mason, Marissa, and a bunch of others there. But congratulations uh, to Mr. and Mrs. Huang. And then Friday evening, the newest of newlyweds in the congregation, Noah Bennett and Caitlin Hill. Let's put our hands together. Congratulate them. Oh, we had a great time. Many of you know Jason and Mary Hill, longtime members of the church, their oldest daughter, Caitlin. We just had a beautiful time together, White Willow Farms, up uh, north of Carmel there. It was just a great night, special time. And every time I look at their picture, I go, did we look that young when we got married? <laughs> did we, Jace? Do you think we look like <laughs> I think we did. Oh, but it was really, really special time. And they're off on their honeymoon, right? They're off and having a great time on their honeymoon. So congratulations. This is a string of, I think we have 10 weddings in the congregation between now and like early September. So you're going to get used to just kind of welcoming the newest of newlyweds, and when you see them, right, congratulate them and be a part of that celebration. All right, if you have a Bible with you, open it up, Galatians chapter 6. Hopefully you pulled out your note sheet on the way in the door. Galatians chapter 6. We're in this series on the life of the Apostle Paul, and we've come to a stage in his journey where he wrote his first letter to the first group of churches that were planted in a territory called Galatia. It's really central and northern Turkey. And so he planted these churches, and he's writing a letter. We started in Galatians 1 last week, where he talked about, if you really want to understand Galatians, it's really about the gospel. And the gospel is the word he chose, is the euangeleon. Euangeleon means good news. And the good news is this, is that God sent Jesus on a rescue mission to a group of people, humanity, humanity that was hopeless and helpless without him. We have no capacity to save ourselves to deal with the sin that needs to be dealt with. We have no abilities to change the human heart in and of ourselves. So God sends Jesus on this rescue mission, and he says the announcement of the good news is this. You can be a part of this rescue mission in Jesus by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. This was the euangelion. This was the gospel. This is the greatest news the world has ever heard. And we talked about how it's news to be announced, to build your life upon, to be believed in. It's not advice to be followed. Jesus didn't come to offer advice to be followed. He came to announce news that's grounded in historical reality to be announced and believed upon. So the gospel is a declaration of an event that has occurred in history. And we got to keep remembering that. Christ crucified, buried, raised. That's historical reality. And Paul is giving his life to announce this news to the ends of the earth, primarily to groups of people who have never heard of it before. And he's calling it the euangelion. He says, this is the best news you could ever possibly hear. I'm not offering you advice to be followed. I'm offering you news to be believed in, to build your life upon, to announce it to the ends of the earth. So we started there with this gospel-grounded, gospel-centered news, and we're going to bookend it today by looking at the closing paragraph of his letter in Galatians 6. For if Galatians is about the gospel, the heart of the gospel is about the cross, and that's where Paul lands it. Look at verse 11 and following. Paul says, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. That's Bible speak for Paul saying, I'm highlighting and underlining. Okay, that's what that means. I mean, he couldn't make more emphasis than right here. He's pulling out the highlighter. He's got the red pen. He's marking up the letters, and he's saying this. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted. The word persecuted means harassed for, to, for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast, hear this, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So three things from this section we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at the action of the cross, we're going to look at the test of our understanding of the cross, 
And then we're going to land it on the power of the cross for living today. The action, the test, and the power. The action, you see, it's rooted right here where he's drawing attention to something Jesus did. I don't know if you've noticed kind of an an increasing view on spirituality in our culture today kind of goes along this line. It doesn't really matter what you believe about Jesus as long as you live like Jesus. You kind of heard that? What really, really matters isn't really what you believe. What really matters is how you live. It doesn't really matter like, you know, if you, what you believe about doctrine or what you believe about theology or what you believe about creation or about Christology or ecclesiology or sanctification or justification or all these big theology. It doesn't really matter what you believe without that. It just really what matters is if you live like Jesus. And the Bible confronts that way of thinking. Paul confronts that way of thinking. He says, that's not right at all. You can't separate what you believe from how you live. The basis for your life flowing out is a foundation of what you understand about who God is, who Jesus is, who he's revealed himself to be, and what he actually did. Notice Paul's boasting is in an action. Did you see that? He's boasting in the cross of Christ. He's not boasting in what Jesus said. Paul's not saying, I boast in the cross of Christ and the Sermon on the Mount, as wonderful as the Sermon on the Mount is. No. I boast in the cross of Christ and the Ten Commandments, as great as the Ten Commandments are. No. I boast in this singular reality. Paul's not boasting in what Jesus said. He is boasting in what Jesus came to do. You tracking with me? To do. It's an action. It matters far more what Jesus did than what he taught us to do, as important as what he taught us to do. Paul's saying it matters more what Jesus did. And we can't lose sight of that. To illustrate it, I thought Matthew 16 is a great conversation Jesus is having with Peter and a few other disciples. I put it in your notes there. The conversation, Jesus walks up, hey, who do people say that I am? And Peter, of course, regularly speaks first. He says, well, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus gives him the thumbs up. Good job, Peter, you got that right. But then Jesus presses it, and I think this is what's being drawn out. He says, verse 21 and following, look at this. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Ouch. Right? Just think. So Peter was perfectly fine with Jesus, a great moral teacher, wonderful vision for morality. Jesus teaches how to pray, teaches how to love other people, teaches what to do with our troubles of this world. Wonderful things you teach us. Peter's perfectly fine with Jesus as a great teacher that way. Where did he start kind of flipping out? Is when Jesus started talking about he's going to go die. You see that? It's when, the, when he's thrust on what Jesus is about to do, the tension rose up, and he's like, ah. And notice Jesus doesn't say, it's okay, Peter. You can kind of believe what you want to believe, and I'll kind of believe what I want to believe. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, hey, Peter, if you can't get your head and your heart around this one reality that I have come to give my life, I'm going to be executed for the sin of the world. This rescue mission has an execution of my life. I'm going to die for the sin of the world. Peter, if you can't get your heart and your head around that, then you're in the grip of Satan. That's what he's saying. That's how significant it is of what Jesus came to do. More important than the Ten Commandments, more important than the Sermon on the Mount, more important than all the great moral teachings that Jesus gave us. The singular most important thing Paul says he's going to boast in is this central claim, the cross of Christ, the death of the Son of God for the sin of the world. We cannot lose sight of that, church. That's what Paul's saying. You can't. He's going to write it in big letters. And he's not writing in big letters about all the wonderful vision Jesus has for morality. I think Jesus is the greatest vision for morality the world's ever seen. I absolutely believe that. But that's still not the most important thing Jesus came to reveal. The most important thing is he came to give his life. The euangelion, the center of the gospel, is the cross. Because when you think about church, I mean, when Jesus was on the scene, did the world really need another great moral teacher to come? Maybe, but not really. I mean, did another teacher need to come on the scene and say, love each other and treat each other fairly? I mean, Buddha taught that. The Old Testament covered those things. But when Jesus came on the scene, he was presenting a vision for what the world really needed. 
What humanity really needed wasn't a new set of moral ethics. What humanity needed was a crucifixion. They needed a way to get a new heart. Humans had to receive a new nature. There had to be a redeeming of what's broken and fallen. Jesus came to offer that. Do you see that, church? That's the core of it. It's not he didn't come to offer a vision for a new morality. He came for the crucifixion of the human heart to be redeemed, restored, renewed, so that we could live the way God intended humans to live, in loving one another and treating each other the way he wanted us treated. Do you see that? That's the core of it. This is why the action of the cross is what Paul is boasting in here. Not just a vision of what Jesus taught, it's really the activity, the core central message of what he did. And what he did was, church, he gave his life. So that's the action of the cross. Let's press it a little further now. We're going to test, if that's so important, Paul, that how do we test that we've got a good understanding of this cross. That we're not like Peter, you know, we're kind of spouting off. Which, by the way, a little parenthesis, if you wonder like how strong human nature is to kind of get out of bounds with their words and, you know, let's just imagine if we might struggle with that today. But just imagine human nature if we kind of get out of bounds and say things and get... I mean, here's Peter, like confronting the Son of God in the flesh and saying to him, you're never going to do that. I mean, that's the core of like, if you want to know where your human rebellion can go... You can actually stand and look at the Son of God and declare to him, never. That's what Peter did. And how about the grace of God? That Peter just, number one, he continued to live. That would be a pretty good miracle there, right? Jesus could have just taken care of him right there. But he said, no, I'm going to work with you. Today, St. Peter's Cathedral, 190 nations. It didn't look like a good start right there. Get behind me, Satan. You know? So, some of you come in today and feel like, yeah, pastor, you got no idea what's going on in my life. You know how broken and messed up my situation is? I commend to you Peter the Apostle, who had a dialogue with Jesus, where Jesus actually called him, get behind me, Satan. He didn't give up on him, and he won't give up on you. If you're not dead, you're not done. You've got breath of life, the lungs, you're here in a blue chair, you're listening on a screen somewhere. If you're not dead, you're not done. You've got life in your lungs. There's still an opportunity for you, for you to come to grips with this singular reality of what Jesus did for you. So how do we test our understanding then? This is so important. Verse 12, those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you. They're actually trying to convince you. Remember, backdrop on this is, this letter was written to who? It was written to a group of early Christians, people who had said yes to Jesus. Primarily Gentile believers, non-Jewish background believers. And so they had begun to follow Jesus. They had begun to put their Uh, faith in him and walk with him. And so it's written to a group of Christians, young in their faith, because the church is young. And a group of Judaizers is what they're called, Jewish background believers from Jerusalem had come up to the church in Galatia. And it began to clutter up the gospel. They kind of cluttered things up. They decided they want to help these Gentile believers start practicing the way of Moses in their following of Jesus and started cluttering a bunch of stuff up. That's why Galatians has so much to say on the centrality of the gospel, by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone. That's why he keeps beating that note over and over again. Because the core was this. These early believers through the Judaizers were being taught, believe in Jesus, yes, but secondly, obey the law of Moses, and then thirdly, you'll have a changed heart. So they were being taught, believe in Jesus, obey the law, and your heart will be changed. Paul writes this letter saying, no, you got the order all wrong. Believe in Jesus, yes, is where you start. You believe in Jesus by grace alone, through faith alone. That's how your heart's changed, too. And then you'll obey the law from a changed heart, three. Do you see that? Order matters, church. Order matters. The rightly ordered of this is what Paul is confronting. So he's writing this letter to say, hey, you got to test. we got to have so much discernment. We've got to have a grounding on what the truth of the gospel is. All the counterfeits become obvious because on the surface it sounds kind of right. Believe in Jesus, obey the law, and your heart will be changed. No, no, no. Believe in Jesus, your heart will be changed so that you'll obey the law. That's the gospel. And remember what he said? If you just miss it by a little bit, you've perverted the whole thing. You've turned it inside out. It's a subtle twisting of the truth. It was A.W. Tozer who said, the difference between the absolutely holy and the horribly demonic is this much. That was what Tozer said. 
And in our world today, young people today especially, that's why we keep encouraging you to be grounded what you believe and why you believe it and understand the historical realities that your faith is built upon, to get grounded in your Christian worldview, to navigate these realities that are being thrust out you, to get to know the truth of who Jesus is so well that all the counterfeits start jumping out at you. We've got to double down on our efforts with this, church. That's why you're going to be hearing about more opportunities to get involved in small groups, more discipleship classes, more times where we're coming together and encouraging each other and spurring each other on to get our minds and our hearts wrapped around a Christ-centered worldview to navigate the realities of our culture today. We've got to double down on this. From children to students and adults, our understanding has got to grow stronger. Our faith has got to get deeper. Our discernment filter has got to get thicker. This is no time to let up. This is no time to coast. This is no time to buy into. It doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters how you live. No, it matters greatly what you believe. There's so much on the line here. And so Paul's saying, hey, you got to test. This is so important that you got to test your understanding of this central reality of, do you really have an understanding of what Jesus did for you? Paul said, you better test this because this doesn't get all cluttered up. And can you imagine if he was writing in big, bold letters in 50 AD, how big his letters might be and how bold they might be in 2022? As noisy as the spiritual climate was in 50 AD, it's significantly more noisy today, right? For all of the false gospels being propagated 50 AD, multiply 10x for today. So in big, bold letters, we've got to test and understand the centrality of the gospel. And the heart of the gospel is the Christ, is the cross. And so he says there in verse 12, here's where he gets at the test. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted, which is harassed for the cross of Christ. Paul says in Galatians 5.11, he calls the, the offense of the cross. He says there's an offensive nature of the cross. So here's how you know you understand the cross. I think I put it in your notes this way. If you've wrestled with and come to grips with and been confronted by the offensiveness of the cross, that's how you know you've begun to understand it. If you've wrestled with and come to grips with and been confronted by the offensiveness of the cross, what's so offensive about the cross this way? Well, have you seen Mel Gibson's scene in The Passion of the Christ many years ago? He put that movie out. I could only watch it one time. Because when you watch it, and if you haven't watched it, I think you should. You should work your way through it at some point in your journey. It's very difficult. There's just a a confrontational nature of the execution brutally of an innocent man. And the way it all transpired, it confronts you. You have to come to grips with this actually happened. I put in your notes a couple of quotes from a couple of atheistic philosophers. Alfred Jules Ayer, he, he said it this way. He was an Oxford scholar and philosopher. He said, the Christian doctrine of the atonement on the cross is, listen, intellectually contemptible and morally outrageous. Yep. And then Bertrand Russell, one of the most well-known atheist British professor, he said, no one who is profoundly human can really believe that God would punish sin like that. And he called the cross the doctrine of cruelty. Now, lest we think that's just commentary reserved for those on the outside of the Christian faith, those kind of outside looking in atheists, agnostics, philosophers, those writing outside. It's also inside, like Paul's dealing with, inside the walls of his own church. Just last year in New York City, there was a big gathering, Christian conference gathering, Christian leaders, pastors, all kinds of folks from around the country. In one of the main sessions, they're singing one of the most beautiful songs we have in the church today, In Christ Alone. We love that song. We sing it often around here. And they came to the line in the song. The original lyric in the line in the song went like this. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That's the original lyric. And in that Christian setting, last year in New York City, with an auditorium filled with pastors and Christian leaders, it was edited to this. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. The cross is confrontational. And if we're not careful, it can press you to edit your theology. Do you see you want to kind of edit around the edges of the confrontation? Do you see that? It sounds really subtle. Of course, the love of God is magnified, but that's not the point of the cross. The cross is about appeasing the wrath of God that would have been poured out on broken and lost human beings. 
And you see Paul saying, you got, here's how you test your understanding. Have you wrestled with that? Have you come to grips with that? That the wrath of God was poured out on the Son of God for your sin and mine? Have you wrestled with this? That we don't get to edit our theology, skirt the edges of it because it's hard, because it's an offensive nature? Do you see that? And I think the core of why it's so offensive, especially in our culture today, I think the cross is the greatest monument to our powerlessness. I'll say it again. I think the cross is the greatest monument to human powerlessness. Listen, if you believe that really good people can find their way to God kind of on their own, if they just kind of live a good life and avoid the biggies and don't step in the big kind of moral landmines, if you just believe people can kind of find their way to God on their own, then the cross is a doctrine of cruelty like Bertrand Russell. The cross makes a zero sense. The cross moves into a category where you can't put it all together. But if you really, really believe like the core of the gospel states, that humans are helpless and hopeless on their own, that we're in need of a rescue that comes from beyond us. If we really, really believe that God sent Jesus to deal with this rescue by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, then the gospel and the cross moves from cruelty to good news, to hope, to a rescue, to salvation, to an euangelion. Bertrand Russell got it wrong because it's not a doctrine of cruelty. From his place of his worldview, it makes total sense why he would declare that because he's missed the starting point. And Paul says the starting point is, humans, you got no shot without the cross. And we can't lose that. Church, we can't lose that. Young people, we can't give that fort up. It doesn't matter how many letters the professor has who's providing lectures in your, in your university arenas. If they've missed the starting point, Paul says they've missed the whole thing. The foundation of all learning and knowledge is Christ crucified. That's written in the founding documents of Harvard University. It's there in the student handbook. The same university that last year ordained and appointed the first atheist chaplain on their campus. Lest we think it's just a 50 AD issue in Galatians. It's happening today. And it's our role as followers of Jesus, right? We've got to test our understanding of this cross. Paul says it's that important. And I think the core of the offense is it runs against the grain of every scheme of self-salvation that we set up. That's the core of the offense. Because man, as Americans especially, we love to make our own way. And we love to chart our own course. And we love to fix it. And we love to figure out, we'll, we'll just get to God on our own wisdom and strength. See, the cross confronts that and says, makes zero sense. you got no shot without the cross. It confronts every scheme of self-salvation. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a, a great British pastor. He was a physician, too. Uh, if you've never read any of his stuff, I commend it to you. Martin Lloyd-Jones written a bunch of stuff. He was a pastor and a physician. Westminster Chapel in London. Most of his ministry, 30-plus years in the early to mid-1900s. When he would get in a conversation with someone, and they, he'd ask them about if they were a Christian, and if they responded to him with, well, I'm trying, Martin Lloyd-Jones would often respond with something like this. He would say, I'm sorry, but you missed it. You don't become a Christian by trying, but by dying. That's the test of our understanding of the cross, where we abandon the trying ways of self-salvation, all those schemes, and we join Jesus in the dying. We embrace this dying reality. The action of the cross is what Jesus did. The test of our understanding of the cross is this confrontation on all the schemes of self-salvation. And then thirdly, the power of the cross for living today. Did you see the power in verse 14? He makes an amazing statement. He says, I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which, underline, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What an amazing statement. Notice he doesn't say that the world is dead. The world isn't dead. The world is dead to you. You see that? That's an important statement. The world's crucified to you, followers of Jesus who have stepped in to this gospel life. It's crucified to you. 
So if you're here and you're worried and you're lonely and you're angry and you're anxious, Paul says it's to the cross that you go. It's to the cross. The world begins to lose its grip the more internalized the cross of Jesus becomes in your life. You say, how, how, how? It's that word boast. The word boast means what you place your confidence in. It means to live with your head up. How do you keep living with your head up? What are you going to base your confidence in? Paul says it's one thing and one thing alone. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. That's it. He says, I'm going to boast in that. So when we have worry or or we're fearful or we're angry and it's ravaging our hearts and we just keep rolling around with anxiety and we can't get through it, Paul's pointing out it's probably a boasting issue. We're probably placing our confidence in the things of this world, in the wrong thing or the wrong someone. We're boasting. We're placing our confidence. We're putting our head up on the wrong things. We're rooting it there. And Paul says, no, you got to shift to this one singular boast. There's another way, Paul says, you boast in the cross. You internalize that he's everything, and without him, you're nothing. That's what you internalize. And you internalize this, that you allow the things of this world to be crucified to you. I like how Tim Keller put it this way. Here's where you find power for living today. Listen to how Keller put it. I put this in your notes. If there's nothing in the world that I boast in, then there's nothing in the world that controls me. Nothing I must have. The Christian is free to enjoy the world because they no longer need to fear it, no worship it. That's that church right there. There's power in the cross for living today. And so worship team, why don't you come on back up? I say all that to set us up for a time at the communion table now. And I couldn't help but think about, could it be, church, that the reason Jesus told his followers that this was a practice that we were consistently to participate in, to hold the broken body and the shed blood, could it be that Jesus, he he wanted to make sure that his little communities of faith all around the world, that they never moved away from this singular reality, that this keeps us gospel grounded and cross-centered. This is what this keeps right here. Because what did he say? He's going to write a letter to the church at Corinth a few years later. And he's going to say, hey, followers of Jesus, you take the bread and you drink the cup and you do what? You proclaim the Lord's death. See that? Until he comes. It's all about the cross. And he's saying, hey, church. You know, as a church, the church of Jesus can get boasting about all kinds of things. Have you noticed? It can get loud and get a megaphone about all kinds of things. And I think Paul and Jesus are like, ah, just, here's what we need to be boasting in. This, that Christ came, Christ died, Christ rose, and Christ offers this life to anyone, anywhere, at any time, from any background. That's what we boast in. And this helps reminding us. This is the basis for our boasting. One more quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones. I put this in your notes because I think it's worth maybe reflecting on this week. He said this, Christianity is not primarily a teaching or a philosophy or a way of life. Hear this. It is before everything else a relationship to a person. All along, the Bible shuts us down to this one matter and holds us up against this one thing. It refuses to even discuss our questions and our problems with us. Hear this. Before you can discuss how to live, it says, what have you made of him? So church, it's the action of the cross. It's what Jesus did for you. He died. And there's a testing of our understanding of that. There's a, there's a confrontation about all our schemes of self-salvation, all the ways we try to manage it in our own wisdom and strength. And then there's power. And the power is through this life, this world can be crucified to you. Man, anybody need some good crucifixion work and the things of this world? I can go through a week and the world just comes too much with me. It just matters too much. The things of this world just matter too much in my eyes and my heart. I need a crucifixion. Jesus says, yeah, it's right here. 
And the question as we come to the table is, what have you made of him? Is he your Lord and Savior? If not, it can be this morning. In just a moment, I'm going to lead us through a prayer. You can confess with your mouth and believe in your heart this morning. You can say, Jesus saved me this morning. You, you can become born again this morning and you can receive communion for the first time. The communion table here isn't reserved for anybody. It's a member of the, this church. It's open to anyone who's a follower of Jesus. And Paul says, we've got to examine what's going on in here before we take these elements. This is supposed to be an act of worship. Do we want to live for him and honor him and serve him and walk in his ways? Not perfectly, but is that the intent of your heart? And come to the table. If it's not, it's a good time to get it straightened out. And maybe you get it straightened out for you is confess with your mouth for the first time. Believe in your heart. Say, Jesus saved me. Or maybe for some others of you, it's a returning today. Today you remember, you remember a time in your life when it was more Galatians 6 like for you. You remember it. You remember when you were boasting more about the cross and less about the things of this world. But if you were honest, it's just gotten distracted and noisy and you started drifting and you're a long ways away from where you want to be and you know God wants you to be. And today, here's the invitation. What have you made of him? Just return. Just turn around. Just come back. That's the muscle you work when you've been away. Just return. Work the comeback muscle based on these elements. There's nothing you've strayed into. There's nothing you've wandered into. There's nothing you've fallen your face in that these elements are not completely sufficient to handle. Nothing. So just return. And as Bryce and this group leads us through a couple of songs here, this is going to be our time as a church family, right? The tables are in the back. If you didn't receive your elements on the way in, just a moment, you can do that. There's some gluten-free options in both corners of the table. They have a little writing on the top for gluten-free. And we're opening up our prayer benches this morning because as a congregation, we believe that by his stripes, Isaiah 53 says, we're made whole. And so we want to give you an opportunity to come and be prayed for. Some of you are carrying some big things physically going on in your life. Your bodies are struggling in some ways. You can come and be anointed with oil and prayed for. We believe Jesus still heals today. And we're going to pray boldly for that. Physical healing, emotional, relational, spiritual healing, whatever you need prayer for, you come to these benches here and there'll be some folks to pray with you and for you. And then just give you the freedom in your own circles where you come as family or you come with some friends or you just want some quiet space yourself at your blue chair. This is going to be your time and space to say, what have you made of him? That's the question. Let's stand together. Let's pray. Jesus, we hold these elements now as we reflect back on a broken body and a shed blood. We do so from a heart of, of gratitude, just so grateful that you would give of yourself, that you would die that we might have life. And so I pray now, if there's anyone who for the first time you just want to say, Maybe you've heard about the gospel, maybe you've known about Jesus, but it's never gotten personal for you. Today it's supposed to get personal. You just pray in your heart right now, Jesus, save me. Forgive me for my sin. I believe you died. I believe you rose. I confess my sin to you. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me new. I want to live for you. Jesus, save me. That's all you got to do. The quietness of your own, you just, Jesus, save me. Rescue me. Renew me. Heal me. Change my heart, oh God. And for some others of you, it might be a turning around today. So that you remember a time when you, you prayed and received Christ as Lord, you began to walk with Him, but you just fallen off the path and gotten distracted and drifted and caught up in all kinds of stuff. And today is about returning. You just turn around and just say, Jesus, I'm coming home. I'm coming back. Forgive me for all the ways I've wandered. I just want to return and start boasting in you, Christ crucified. Crucify the world to me. Maybe that's the prayer for the returners. Crucify the world to me. You can just pray that right where you're at. And as you internalize those elements, you internalize his love, his grace, the renewing power of his spirit in you. And then for all the rest of us, 
Lord, we take these elements and we do so as an act of worship, thanking you for a broken body and a shed blood and collectively declaring to you that we want to be the kind of church family that boasts in Christ alone, the gospel alone and the cross alone. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Partake whenever you're ready. Come to the prayer benches if you'd like prayer.